Ryan uh, Zura from Polychain Capital is going to introduce our two next speakers. Thanks, Ryan. Cool. Hey, guys. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, and I will be very quick. Uh, I just want to talk a few minutes about why uh, Polkadot is the single project that I am most excited about on this planet. Um, even before Polychain, I have spent uh, most of my, almost all of my time uh, over the last many years uh, evaluating teams in this space um, or working with them very closely after making an investment. And um, basically, I spend all day thinking about this and dealing with these teams and, and, and making evaluations of, of where they are in, in their roadmap. And uh, without, it, usually what you'll find in many teams across the space is they have one or two or maybe larger teams have four or five really talented developers. And the one thing that really struck my eye very quickly about this team is that where most teams in this space have four or five strong uh, blockchain developers, the Parity team is really 45 deep of extraordinary technical talent um, that is really pushing the limits of um, or the frontiers of this space in, in new directions on governance, on sort of low level protocol design, um, and on just usability, you know, Substrate, which is a VM and uh, uh, and blockchain kind of in a box, is is really an amazing innovation that uh, doesn't get the the attention that that it deserves. But Polkadot for me is a really special protocol because since it is uh, kind of connective tissue between the otherwise siloed protocols, um, it's a really important piece of infrastructure. And in a previous life, I worked in, in infrastructure and kind of draw the analogy of, of Polkadot in the grand scheme of our infrastructure to airports. Now, you may uh, be able to, to Google on your phone and figure out that airports are actually the most expensive and highest revenue per, squ per unit, say per square foot or per square meter piece of infrastructure on the planet. Um, that's, what, that's because to get to these disparate lands that you want to go to, you have to funnel yourselves through these, uh, you, you know, through these airports, and there's really no other way to kind of connect yourself it to, to disparate lands. The same sort of thing applies in, in kind of the blockchain world. To, for a, a Tezos smart contract to be able to have an arbitrary call on an Ethereum smart contract, realistically, we're going to have to route it through Polkadot. That makes that an incredibly valuable piece of infrastructure um, in order to connect those two uh, disparate lands. And, and really the reason why I think that this could be um, a very, very special project. Uh, and so without uh, further ado, I will uh, present Bjorn, who is leading a lot of the work uh, around Polkadot. Thanks. After these words, we obviously all hope we can live up to these expectations, but we're doing our best. Great, so thank you everyone for coming today. Um, we were here for the first time, I think two months ago, um, at another meetup, and it's, it's really nice to see a few familiar faces. Um, we have some new content for you today, new updates, um, especially Rob will walk you through some of our newest developments, new research results, um, and I really want to um, cut it a bit short today, give you a quick introduction before handing over to Rob. And after that, if we still have time, I want to give you a few demos, show you what you can already play around and talk potentially a bit more about um, Parity Substrate, which is, I believe, a really, really powerful new tool in the ecosystem. Right. Um, so basically, Parity, right? We've, after we founded the company three years ago, uh, and even before that, when um, Gavin set out to uh, build Polkadot, uh, Ethereum in 2014, um, like since then, we have implemented a lot of core infrastructure um, that's related to blockchain, be it the Parity Ethereum client, the Parity Bitcoin client, and a lot of tools and stuff around that. And um, I really want to walk you through a bit um, why we set out from that background to really um, try to build something new, um, which is Polkadot and Substrate, right? So, 
what we've seen is, right, over these years since Bitcoin emerged back then, is that there have been many projects setting out to build new kind of a blockchain software that provides the user with different sorts of feature. From going back to Bitcoin, where you really had like uh, Satoshi set out to build like an open financial system that allows you to transfer coins from A to B, right? And um, Gavin really wanted to be Ethereum to be more of a um, um, ubiquitous, um, trustless computer that's out there that allows you to build all sorts of decentralized applications. We have now, um, I would say, dozens and dozens of different kind of machines out there that we would put in the pot of blockchain technology. And what we see is that uh, most of them differ in what we call the state machine, which is like, what kind of like what kind of features does it provide us this software? What can we do with that software from a user perspective? Um, whereas what all of these all of these blockchains want is to be secure. They want to be secure, and some of them want to be immutable. Some of them want to have strong, clear governance processes to change the state after the fact. And it's it has become very clear and very obvious that. On the state machine side, one size won't fit at all, right? If you want to do something crazy new, like a high-frequency trading ledger, right? You can't build that on Ethereum today. And you certainly can't build that on Bitcoin today. So what a project does that wants to do that, right? They either fork a code base of what exists today and try to tweak it, or they set out to build an entirely new code base, right? To build the whole networking layer, to build a new consensus algorithm, and so forth. Whereas what they really want to do is they basically just want to create a new runtime, a new state machine that provides them with these set of features that um, really serve for their use case. So we believe that one size really doesn't fit at all on that level. And one area in particular where we have seen that is um, the enterprise space. Um, it's very clear, these enterprises figure out, hey, these public ledgers, permissionless ledgers that are out there right now don't cater for their needs, so what do they do? They take software, tweak it, you know, add something to the EVM, tweak fabric, whatever, and uh, run it in a permissioned, very permissioned and private settings. The problem with that is, we end up again in a very fragmented landscape. We end up with all these isolated data silos, isolated silos of functionality that can't talk with each other, right? And that kind of defeats the whole purpose of why we set out to have blockchain in the end. Especially because as more of these separated projects that you have, as um, um, less secure is each of them. And this is something that Rob will deep dive into and I don't want to talk too much about right now. Um, so, and that is really basically the point why we set out to build Polkadot. Because we really saw this need for different designs of state machines. And we saw the need for all of them to share some kind of common umbrella, some kind of framework to allow them all to be secure and talk to each other while being able to optimize for certain use cases. And this is largely what people talk about when they say, oh, interoperability. We want these different kind of systems to be interoperable with each other. But there are, I think there's some confusion in the space and um, lacking clarity about what interoperability really means. And what I believe that sets Polkadot apart from all the other projects, from other, all the other proposals in the space is how we see interoperability. So while it's really desirable, right, to be able to transfer tokens from one state machine, from one chain to another, it's much more powerful to be able to have these chains, these state machines, talk in an arbitrary way, to relay arbitrary messages, because that eventually means that you can have um, one chain, right, basically call a contract on another chain, so that it looks much more like in Ethereum where one contract can call another contract in an arbitrary way just across chains and just that these chains don't live um, in this constrained environment of an EVM with these constraints that you were given by that. Um, and this is really where, where, where 
Polkadot takes a different approach than other interoperability proposals out there. Um, another part is that we set out to build uh, Polkadot with um, the notion of generality, with um, the notion of being so flexible so that it can absorb what's to come. So we wanted to really support the past, the present, and the future. And what we mean by that is it should be able to connect um, new chains to those that already exist, that are already running, that are already um, having a strong community of validators or so forth, or miners, right? So it should be able to allow new chains to talk to um, chains like Ethereum or to Bitcoin. At the same time, it should support all um, present um, blockchain, present gen or current generation blockchain technology. Everything that's being built right now with the current knowledge that we have, be it Tezos, be it um, Definity, um, and whatsoever, right? But beyond that, and this is really critical, we want Polkadot to be able to absorb stuff that's to come, stuff that we don't know what it looks like. Maybe um, new development in, in governance systems, new development in consensus system, new developments in um, how we can scale a blockchain within a runtime, how we can design state machines better in order to scale, for example. And we kept um, the framework as flexible as possible to allow these new um, developments to be taken on within the Polkadot framework. And I want to give over to Rob right now at this point and then um, later on jump up here again to um, answer all your questions and if we have time I'm going to walk you through of some of the uh, you know tools we've already built and uh, some of the stuff you can try out today. Thank you. Yeah, um, huge thank you to Ryan and Bjorn for the amazing introductions. Uh, sorry about the small slides. Uh, I think that this is sort of in spirit of this presentation. Uh, our idea is that actions speak louder than words, so we come to you today with very small words. Uh, <laughs> so the, the goal of my talk today is really to um, sort of not just talk about what Polkadot does, but also how you can use it. So I'm sure there are some developers in the audience today. We're in San Francisco. This is a hub of developers. Uh, so basically what I'm going to be going into is like, what does it mean to build one of these chains in the Polkadot network? How do you actually do that? What are the tools that are at your disposal? Uh, so without further ado, um, we'll start with our design principles. So that's one is heterogeneous, that we support an ecosystem of vastly different chains. We believe that specialization can lead to optimization. If you are constrained by your data formats or your means of execution, you're not going to be able to get the maximum performance out of the platform that you build upon. That's just a given. Uh, so we want chains to be built that are specifically tailored for their uses. Uh, the next one is that it's scalable, that it can grow, that it can uh, uh, handle all the load that's thrown at it. The next part is that it's secure. Uh, we design a system which is uh, formally provable to be secure. Uh, that even if you know malicious actors who are coordinating in ways that are probably practically impossible uh, and can shut off communications between all the honest people, uh, that they still can't take over the network. So we prove all this game theory uh, and we make sure that it's resistant to these kinds of attacks and that the incentives are aligned. So these are our uh, three core design principles. So to speak a bit about what the two sides of blockchain are. Uh, so the first side is the state machine. This is really you know, what you care about when you think about a blockchain. It's what does this blockchain do? So what are, what are the things that makes this blockchain unique? It could be processing transactions or executing smart contracts or uh, managing identities and that sort of thing. Uh, so that's what the state machine is. And as a developer, this is usually what you care about. Uh, the other thing that you care about with a blockchain is consensus. So that's essentially how you coordinate agreement on which state transitions in that state machine have actually taken place. You know, did funds go to A to B to C, or did they go from C to B to A? Consensus will let you choose one of those and agree upon it universally. 
Uh, but what we've seen a lot of the time is that we have many teams who have a very unique idea for a state machine, and they end up working on both of these problems because they try to build a blockchain where they have to solve both of these problems. They need it to be secured, uh, but they also really want to build that core part, their state machine that, they're, uh, that they've got the idea for. So the idea with Polkadot is basically that the consensus is taken care of uh, by the network, and chains that have unique state machines are simply attached to it and they can feed into the security. I'll get back to that in a moment. Uh, but essentially, the way that it works is that we have these multiple state machines that are all attached and running in parallel. They're all, they're all advanced in lockstep. They can be, uh, if things go wrong, they can be reverted in lockstep. I'll go into why that's important in a second. Um, and this essentially increases throughput. We're parallelizing execution of many blockchains under a single consensus algorithm. Uh, we've reduced basically the problem to a data availability problem. Uh, it's, it runs into quadratic scaling issues as opposed to linear. Um, research into how to push that into super quadratic is uh, ongoing. So connecting blockchains is pretty hard, but actually getting security resources for them is, is pretty hard as well. Uh, what we've seen is that you know there's only a limited number of miners, like people who have GPUs or ASICs and they want to throw their mining power at securing blockchains. Or to put it on the proof of stake angle, there's only a limited amount of people who really want to deploy capital for proving stake. So essentially for every blockchain that you have sitting around that's trying to gather security, it's competing against all those other ones to gather it. Uh, because if someone is mining on Zcash, they're not mining on Ethereum. And they're definitely not mining on Bitcoin as well. Uh, they have to split their resources. So this idea of pooling security rather than having chains um, split it between themselves actually means that the whole system ends up being more secure. And the reason this is important is because everything has a price. So when we talk about the amount of miners on a specific chain or the amount of stake attached to a specific chain, we're just, you know, we, we might speak about finality, whether it's probabilistic or otherwise. Uh, deterministic absolute finality is not really absolute. It just means you have to pay this much money to revert it because there's that many stakers with that much money attached to it. Uh, so imagine that we have this chain on the top, uh, and the diagram doesn't show that well on this project, unfortunately, but we, you know, imagine that you can see arrows. Uh, so this Chain on the top has a lower amount of security. It's sending a message from this green block into the other chain. So we've got a cause on one chain and an effect on another. So let's say that this cheaper to attack chain gets reverted, and all of a sudden that green block that had that cause isn't there anymore. All of a sudden we've got causes without effects. That's essentially double spending, but in the context of pure interoperable interactions, you could have you know, transitive effects and things like that. It could really cascade out and uh, cause a lot of problems. Uh, so we really want to avoid that. Are you helping me out? Oh yeah, there we go. <laughs> See, we do know how to solve problems. Um, <laughs> so it, to actually show you that this is a, a, a fact, you know, the, the cost of attacking real chains that are deployed right now uh, is, is pretty low. So there's this website uh, that actually shows you how much it costs to attack various different chains. Uh, and it's pretty cheap for some of them, I think even ranging in like a thousand bucks to 51% attack for an hour. Uh, yeah, but can we still change? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, so here are some of the prices. Like you have pretty high market caps on some of these, but then it might cost like you know, only 10,000 bucks to 51% to for an hour, or 500 bucks for one of these. I mean, that's pretty low. Uh, so you definitely don't want to end up in that situation. Uh, and now it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, trade-offs. Great. Uh, so now I would just dive into basically how some of these interchain communication paradigms might look. Uh, so one that Bjorn brought up earlier that's probably really interesting to a lot of you is a cross-chain smart contract call. So the model that we work in is uh, purely asynchronous. Uh, so it's unlike synchronous smart contract calls where it says if, you know, uh, you make the call and then it waits to do all that work and then you get a response. It's more like you dispatch a call and then you might get a message back later that contains the result of that call. But you can do some work in the meantime. Uh, so chain A would have a break-in 
contract or handler, something like that, that can handle incoming messages from other chains. Um, and these messages are really just raw data, but it knows how to interpret formats that it's expecting. So one of those formats might be for a cross-chain smart contract call. So let's say that chain B sends a message to chain A. Chain A has this break-in contract that knows how to interpret that message as a smart contract call. It forwards it to an internal contract in that chain. Now that might be something like executing a virtual machine or it might just be something that acts like a contract, right? Because with this communication interface, everything is abstracted out. Um, and yeah, so that's basically the, the, the run of it. One thing that's really important to a lot of uh, users and applications is the ability to get receipts and acknowledgements for calls. So like, did this smart contract call actually happen? You don't want to send messages out into a black box and just uh, wonder, you know, did that ever get received? So the way that this paradigm would work is essentially that you send a message which contains two parts. It contains uh, the initial trigger thing that you want to happen, like a smart contract call or a token transfer or something along those lines. And it also sends along custodianship of some dots. And these dots will be used to fund the return message being sent. Uh, but there's an important distinction to notice here, which is uh, what data you actually need to handle receipts on the parachain level. So this action of producing a message, sending it out, funding a return message is fairly complex and involved. And you only really need that when you need to observe things within the parachain state. At the application layer, you have access to all the parachain states that you need. You can see every single parachain state because you act as a light client for all of those and can fetch it on demand. Um, and then just to walk through roughly what like a, a bank chain might look like. So Bjorn brought up, uh, for example, that we want to make things a bit easier for enterprise. Uh, so if you had, say, a consortium chain that's providing essentially trust for some pegged assets, the way that this would work is that it lives as a parachain on the Polkadot network, but the state transition of this, sta uh, of this chain is basically, did the consortium sign off on this arbitrary state transition? So you can't include anything that wasn't signed off on by the consortium, but the consortium can include anything that they want to. Uh, so they're managing all of their transfers of money internally there. Uh, they don't have to justify or uh, expose accounts or anything like that, uh, but they can still move things around send messages out and respond to messages, which means that you could theoretically uh, query token balances and things like that to such a chain. So now I would go into just what does it mean to build on Polkadot? Like what are the tools at your disposal? So the building blocks that we use right now, um, and this is, some of these are, uh, you would have to be locked into, some of them not. So one of them is the Rust language. So this is something that we've been using for ages. We're, we're big enthusiasts about Rust. Uh, it's essentially a very fast programming language. Um, it compiles onto native code like C or C++, but it also has a lot of static checking uh, that basically eliminates all kinds of security issues that you would normally find in those languages. Uh, then we also use WebAssembly. So WebAssembly is something uh, that we think is going to be probably the future of virtual machines for blockchains. Uh, we're definitely not the only ones that seem to have that opinion, simply because it's a virtual machine that uh, is designed to be fast. It has support of most major compiler authors. It has support of most major browser vendors. Um, that means that you're gonna have tooling and language support beyond something of a specific blockchain virtual machine. Uh, so it's maybe better to use something more general. Um, and lastly, we use libpeer-to-peer. -peer. This is a set of like very flexible peer-to-peer -peer networking libraries. Uh, so. Our approach is to write blockchains, write these parachains in, in Rust, compile them down to WebAssembly, and then uh, run the overlay network in libp2p. So what a parachain really is, is just a piece of WebAssembly code that says, you know, it can accept blocks, and it can accept proofs of blocks, and it says, was that transition good, or was that transition bad? That's really all it is. So this is the core building block. So essentially all you have to do as a developer is write this piece of code uh, that decides whether blocks are good. Uh, the other thing that you need is uh, a node that lives outside of the system that we call a collator, which uh, creates the new blocks and it creates proofs. So it's something akin to like what a miner or staker or baker would be right now, where it just sort of sits around, it collects transactions in its queue, whatever those may be. Uh, 
and then authors candidate blocks to be submitted to the network for potential inclusion. Uh, so only author things, for example, that cause that WebAssembly to evaluate to true. Um, and the last thing that you have to be cognizant of is the message queues. Essentially that uh, every chain has message queues going out to every other chain and coming in from every other chain. Um, but actually all routing and such is uh, handled for you with more hidden complexity. Uh, so as a 10,000 foot view, we have a relay chain at the center. We have parachains that sort of are agreed upon, you know, how they advance by the relay chain. The relay chain relays messages between them. Uh, and lastly, we have bridges, which is how we include new, or include old chains that uh, weren't written with, it, with Polkadot in mind, like things like Ethereum or Bitcoin. Uh, so those are treated from the perspective of Polkadot basically as the same as any other chain, any other parachain. It's just that this chain knows how to interpret the finality of those blockchains and can interpret messages being sent from it. Uh, so what does Polkadot look like? to a developer. I mean, essentially, uh, what you have to do is implement this function. So it's execute a state transition, take the last block header, which could you know, be arbitrary data, but it typically contains things like Merkle roots or what have you, uh, maybe receipts, things like that. Um, you get a proof of the new transition, which would be like a block body and a state proof. So some subset of the Merkle tree maybe that you need to execute all the transactions and get all the balances that you need. Uh, and then some new messages in. And if that's good, you get out the new header of the new block and the outgoing messages to various chains. Uh, so to write this runtime, WebAssembly gives you the power of many languages that you're familiar with, have good tooling, uh, and are performant. Uh, and I'll get, on, I'll get to this in a moment, but uh, we have this tool called Substrate that will basically give you this collator node for free. Uh, this is Substrate. I wanted to get the logo up. Uh, so Substrate is uh, a, sen a set of tools for writing blockchains. So uh, the Parity team is one that has probably some of the most experience building blockchain nodes. Uh, out of any team in the world. So have bit, it built an Ethereum node that's not just an Ethereum node, it has pluggable consensus and WebAssembly and all kinds of stuff built in. A Bitcoin node, and now is doing the first implementation of a Polkadot node. Uh, so when we sat down and started to write the Polkadot node, we sort of realized like we've done this all before. We've done the networking, we've done the database stuff, we've done the peer-to-peer -peer layer, we've done that all before. So why don't we, to make this easier for ourselves in the future, and to make it easier for other teams, just group that into a set of libraries and a framework that anybody can call upon. Um, so that basically takes care of most of the hard stuff of writing a blockchain node for you, so you can really focus on almost nothing but writing that state transition system, uh, which is the thing that you probably want to build in the first place. Uh, so to look at the stack of how Substrate operates is essentially a libp2p powered peer-to-peer -peer network, which it serves as a communication mechanism for a consensus process. The consensus process gives you agreement over uh, execution of some WebAssembly runtime. So this is just, again, WebAssembly code that says uh, whether transitions are good. So this runtime is actually quite interesting because it can be basically composed of very small pieces that are sort of plugged together. So uh, Parity provides with Substrate something called the Substrate Runtime Module Library. And it's all these little pieces like uh, governance, slashing, staking. One we wrote for Polkadot is uh, parachains. There's one for WebAssembly smart contracts. And you can basically just glue these together, do a macro invocation, and it comes up with your transaction type and gives you a node. Uh, so you can basically come up with some pre-built parts, some parts that some other people have wrote, and then write your very specific thing, like for example, our parachains module for Polkadot, and you come out with actually a full-fledged blockchain. Uh, so with that in mind, what might it look like to actually put together a parachain? So you would select some modules from the SRML, you write your parachain-specific stuff, and Substrate just links them together. And the most important thing is that like Substrate is right now not just designed for writing parachains. It's something that you write freestanding blockchains with. So you can write something that stands on its own and isn't part of Polkadot at all with it. Uh, but then there's also going to be sort of a component that slightly alters the way that you write your substrate chain, but will share mostly the same code, that just turns it into a parachain, 
where it understands that instead of using its own consensus process, it's just gonna plug into the one that Polkadot provides. And with that, it would give you a, a call later node for free. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna speak really briefly about the consensus stuff we're doing because uh, that's essentially the next milestone we're about to release and it's also uh, really cool. So to get into that, our goals are basically that we want a low barrier to entry for anybody who wants to participate in consensus. Uh, essentially that you don't need to have millions of dollars at your disposal and also that you have really high grade, high performance uh, servers floating around. It's just too much. We want somebody who has you know, some money to put down but not out of reach of you know, someone with a decent job um, and has technical experience who knows how to use computers and set up servers and that sort of thing. But we don't want it to be any further out of reach than that. Um, we want to separate block production from finality. Uh, so that allows us to essentially have different sets for people who can produce blocks and add to the chain and those who uh, prove that those blocks are never going to be reverted. And the nice thing there is that we can then uh, really abstract over things like block times where we say like, oh, it doesn't take, you know, we can have finality reached at an arbitrary time, but we have block times that are really fast or really slow. So what block production looks like is you have something like a round-based system where you have some list of people who are allowed to produce blocks. Um, time is divided into discrete steps, and for every step you select somebody who's allowed to author blocks. It could just be one block, it could be many blocks. Uh, but the important thing is the coordination over that time slot. Uh, and since it's randomly chosen, that means that eventually you get a long run of honest validators and you don't have censorship resistance or you do have censorship resistance, you don't have censorship. Uh, then the more exciting thing is probably the finality gadget. So our idea there is, uh, I guess we're probably pretty familiar with like Bitcoin's common prefix thing, so probabilistic finality. This idea that when you have a bunch of nodes that are mostly honest, uh, and network conditions are good, with increasingly higher likelihood, depending on how far back you go, they all have the same common prefix of the chain. That's what we call probabilistic finality in Bitcoin. Uh, so our idea was to turn this into a deterministic algorithm, uh, where you can actually, under bad network conditions, still just pass around some messages that lets a set of peers coordinate over what exactly is the common prefix of the chain that they all share. And this provides what we would call accountable safety, which means for any block in this common prefix, if, those, if any of those nodes start to author blocks that don't include all of that common prefix, that they would lose their stake. Um, so that's sort of the diagram of what that might look like. We have seven validators and two forks. There are three on each side, so there's no 51% majority on either side. Um, but still, it can figure out that the common ancestor of those two chains is finalized which means that even if there are large network partitions, as soon as they resolve, you can finalize all the blocks that have happened, for example. Uh, you can finalize millions of blocks at once without much more overhead over finalizing a single block at once. And furthermore, that uh, block finality times are dynamic, uh, that we don't have to wait one minute or two minutes. It's simply as soon as these validators can make uh, messages happen between them. Uh, yeah, so our ideas with governance is simply, you know, it, it's quite similar to what Tezos is offering. Uh, we want it to be upgradable, not only in the system itself, so, you know, oh, we have this new zero knowledge stuff, we have this new scaling mechanism, routing between parachains and messages and stuff like that, but also that the governance mechanism is self-upgradable. There are a lot of new signals coming out, uh, things like identity-based quadratic voting, futarchy, liquid democracy, uh, things that might be worth incorporating, uh, and also to sort of phase out certain processes as the blockchain leaves nascency. Uh, yeah, so on-chain governance basically means that you have a defined process as opposed to very nebulous processes floating around that are hard to interpret. Uh, of course, you can't really get away from the idea that everybody could just run different software. So off-chain governance always trumps on-chain. Uh, however, on-chain provides a easy path for upgrades that are non-controversial so that they don't have to require hard fork. Uh, yeah, so just to quickly take inventory of where we are with the Polkadot project. Uh, we've done a number of proofs of concept so far, so our idea is to schedule the 
uh, development in proofs of concept of around seven probably. So what we've done so far is uh, the initial one was just a simple chain, balance transfers, proof of stake system, and governance. We did the, uh, as far as we know, first live upgrade of a chain to bring this to POC2. So we never restarted the chain to bring it to POC2, which was an initial parachains implementation uh, lacking interchain messaging. So we would have that scalability aspect, but not the interoperability aspect. Um, POC3 is the implementation of this consensus stuff that I described in the slides. Before that, it was using a much more naive consensus system. Uh, now we'll get the full benefit of those features that I just described. Uh, and POC4 is the one that I would be the most excited about, you know, because it's the theme of the talk, uh, which is basically when I would say it's ready for developers. Those APIs that you see about uh, implementing collator nodes and implementing uh, state transitions really are unlikely to change beyond that point. Because beyond that, POCs five, six, and seven are mostly going to be around uh, implementing hidden complexity within Polkadot that provides economic security as the underpinnings for those state transitions. Uh, but from a pr developer's perspective, it's, it's more or less complete after POC4. Uh, and this is the time that we would really like to uh, get things in your hands and show you that you can actually build on that. You know, that it's not just uh, empty words up here. Uh, and yeah, so in parallel, we really are building these uh, developer parachains. And I guess that about wraps it up. Uh, I'm going to plug Web3 Summit once more. It'll be pretty dope. Just go there. Uh, and thank you very much. Uh, so how easy will it be to like decide to start building on Substrate and then maybe like two months into the future decide you actually want to put that, that your blockchain as a parachain? Uh, is it going to be like a really easy process? Um, just wondering in terms of like, you know, if you can use Substrate and then go along three months later decide, yeah, I want to be part of the, the whole entire network. Yeah. Um, this is basically one of the goals. The only thing that would be hard is if you've already deployed a chain that's written without Polkadot in mind because then you would have to write a bridge. But if you've got a code base that's under development, not in production, it should be fairly easy to switch, uh, perhaps even as simple as just linking a new library for consensus uh, to turn it from a freestanding chain into a parachain. Yeah, th that's basically one of the parts we are like looking, potentially we can actually achieve it, that it will be as easy if you've built your uh, chain on substrate, that at some point, whatever your governance mechanism within that chain is, they can vote to update their runtime, right, to say like, oh, actually we want to we wanna use that um, uh, um, consensus mechanism. And the consensus mechanism would be then dot rather than your own. So what you currently have in Substrate, right, like, like Rob showed this diagram where you have lib P2P on the bottom, consensus and the WebAssembly execution environment, and within that you have, right, that's a runtime. And in the runtime you have all these modules and so forth. But like critically, currently, what we have in consensus is uh, multiple options. So right now, what it is running is kind of like a, a PBFT derivative similar to Tendermint, right? That's what he called naive uh, consensus implementation. And um, that is what you can use right now. That is what Polkadot, our testnet, is using right now, right? But as Rob said, our next update, POC3, will use this kind of hybrid consensus where you have uh, a synchronous finality gadget and this continuous block production. Um, yeah, and we are probably, over the course of the next year, we are going to add a few more consensus options, which means, really, you can take Substrate, as it is, as a framework to, to launch uh, chains of all kind, right? They don't even necessarily have to do that much with Polkadot just yet, right? Just that they mean if you build on Substrate right now, you are almost guaranteed to be compatible to being a parachain tomorrow once uh, Polkadot launch. And I think that makes it, uh, uh, that is very powerful, right? Yes, how do nodes uh, choose what chains to secure? And like, how do they allocate time for that? Yeah, so this is something I've gone into a lot in my earlier talks, but it's something that takes like, I say 30, 45 minutes to really go into in depth. 
Uh, but essentially, you have a pool of validators who achieve consensus, um, and they know how to interpret validity for all chains. It's just which one they are randomly assigned to by some randomness beacon in the protocol at any given time. Uh, collator nodes are basically, it could be anybody. It's not a permissioned thing to spin up a collator. Anybody could just say, I want to be a collator. And those are specific to each parachain because they understand the rules of block authorship for that parachain. Hi, um, so I have like two questions and so they're somewhat related. And the first thing is um, how you can convince like existing just like like public chains, right? So Zcash, Monero, and just like many other chains like with a different like hashing algo and like just a different consensus like to move on to Polkadot. So it seems like they have to adopt your like new consensus like mechanism and that's kind of an like intrusive manner. Um, and like the second related question is, um, because I have been running like a GPU farm on, like, like, um, on the side. And so what is the miner's incentive? Like because like miner, like so if I'm a GPU miner and so I actually like need like different options. So, so like that's why I can swing or just like point my hash rate so to what it is the like, most like profitable. Um, so if I pull everything with this like security pooling thing and that's actually contradictory to the miner incentive. Um, yeah, so, exactly. So, so those are the two questions I have. Uh, so uh, I guess to address the, the first point, this is a, uh, a proof of stake system. So it's not one where we compete, you know, we try to get all the miners on all the chains to sort of work together. It's more like to make them irrelevant uh, because we have a proof of stake system that secures the transitions for all chains at once. Um, in order to think about incentives of existing chains to join the system, I think that this is very difficult because these chains have their own communities. They, have, they exist, they are established. Uh, so for that reason, we don't try to say that, you know, we're just going to take every chain and immediately put it native into Polkadot. This is really the idea behind uh, bridging. So the idea that you can interpret the consensus and interpret what has happened on chains outside of Polkadot uh, and still listen to events that have happened on those chains and bridge events out to them as well. Uh, now those chains will need to be reasonably secure because then you start to run into the problem of reversions on one chain and not in the rest of the Polkadot network as well. Uh, but there are other strategies uh, for building bridges that don't really have to think about finality at all and they only think about fork choice rules. Uh, yeah. One thing uh, that I would like to mention just to um, show how powerful really this tool substrate is, is that one of our colleagues, uh, Wei Tang, um, um, literally set out to um, build whatever was specced out so far for Ethereum 2.0, Shaspa, on Substrate in less than two weeks, to my knowledge. So like, because it gives you all these parts that you really don't want to care about when you want to innovate in the space, and you can focus on that part you want to, you know, you, you can make a difference, um, it's just really a supercharging innovation. Uh, I, I I think I do have a question. Uh, what is about onboarding process for existing Solidity developers or EOS developers? Is there any like a smooth transition to start develop for Polkadot? Yeah, so the question is about um, onboarding of Ethereum developers onto Substrate slash Polkadot? Because the tool chain is different. Yeah, I believe exactly. there are some differences. So EOS does like pretty terrible job on that. So yeah. how do you mitigate? So this, yeah, this is, this is a good question. Um, Essentially, we've uh, it is it is a different set of tools uh, compared to what you might be used to with Ethereum. So, if you're an Ethereum developer, you are used to maybe using uh, Truffle and MetaMask and uh, Solidity and uh, the tools that revolve around that. Uh, we are mostly geared towards using Rust. Of course, you can use any language that compiles to WebAssembly. Uh, so, there are two things that I'd like to mention. One is that the paradigms stay the same. So uh, these ideas of persistent storage between runs of a smart contract uh, and things like that, asynchronous messaging, those are still paradigms that you would be familiar with as a blockchain developer already. Uh, the other thing is that when you move into more mature languages uh, than compared to what is running on the EVM right now where you have uh, Solidity and Viper which are both quite new and the tooling is still evolving around them because the languages are being developed almost in parallel with the tooling, is that uh, 
we think that, for example, tooling in Rust already has so many people behind it that it's not going to be hard to surpass the level of tooling that already exists for these EVM-based languages. Uh, and to further accentuate that, I know that Parity is working on sort of a, uh, what we call an EDSL, so a domain-specific language. That's an alteration of Rust slightly via compiler plugins and macros just to make uh, writing for blockchains a bit easier. Yeah, the, uh, the source of randomness. So it's not something that's fully agreed upon yet. Uh, like it's not set in stone, but the one that we're using right now is one called collective coin flipping. Uh, so essentially that's, it's based on many prior block hashes. Uh, the unit that it's built upon is something called low influence functions. Uh, so essentially it's, uh, imagine that instead of trying to come up with a full random beacon of, 30, uh, of 256 bits, you were just trying to find agreement on one bit. So let's take three bits from prior block hashes and see which one has the majority. Just take that. And then what if you had three groups of three and you had the outputs being hierarchical? Then you would have you know, another bit. And if you had three groups of three groups of three, you, know, you could have another bit, which at each stage is even less influenceable because you've got them mostly being determined at that point. Uh, and there's a really good paper on exactly how this works and the security proofs behind it uh, that you know, I'm not going to recite here, but I would love to uh, distribute to you. Any final questions for Rob over here? Um, it's just a follow-up to the question in the beginning, but um, or maybe just about my understanding of your presentation. But the the uh, Wasm code that defines the state machine of your chain, that is what is being um, sort of executed by the, by the different validators in the Polkadot network, is that correct? Yeah, exactly. So it's coordinating state transitions, which are uh, basically outputs of the state transition function that have been executed with the prior output. So to be in, so I would distribute this WASM blob to every validator that would then, or that is validating my, my chain. So part of the state of the relay chain is the canonical state transition function of each parachain that's attached. So everybody has the code for every parachain. Just really briefly um, to show you what's out there right now. So there's a website called um, telemetry.polkadot.io where you can um, basically see data of all the nodes that are running two different networks. One is called Komalanke, uh, which is our POC2 testnet of Polkadot. You see it has like 48 nodes running from different parts um, and so forth. You can see a lot of data here. Anyways, there's another chain, a uh, substrate-based chain running right now in, as a testnet. It's a WASM smart contract chain, right? That's independent of Polkadot so far, but could potentially be once Polkadot is deployed, right, be added as one of its parachains. Um, so telemetry is there, and that comes also for free with any kind of substrate chain that you build, right? Um, same as with um, the Polkadot's app portal, where you have an, um, you actually have an, app, like a simple block explorer where you can go through here the justifications of different validators um, for a certain block. Uh, you see extrinsics, um, and you have all these different modules that allow you, for example, to transfer tokens. I would have to add tokens first on this lap, uh, accounts first on this laptop. Um, you have staking, you have a democracy module, and you, you can imagine how you build uh, a certain substrate runtime um, library module, and you build a UI piece that works with this certain module. And you ship it, and it's available for us at available for any kind of blockchain that wants to use that. Um, right, you, you have accounts that you can add, create here, um, an address book, you can inspect the chain state. Um, uh, here you see, for example, I can look, hey, at staking, um, who are the current era, wait, uh, yeah, right. I can inspect all sorts of things. I can do extrinsics, which are kind of like contract calls almost, um, just in, in, in the substrate model. Um, and then, last but not least, we have this uh, polkadash 
Bitcoin.io dashboard that shows you um, um, all sorts of things about the current validator set, who is nominating what validators, how much these validators are staked, and so forth. Um, the current validator set, the next validator set, right. And basically this comes all if you wanna, you can reuse all these parts when you build your substrate chain, basically. Thanks.